introducing small changes to it to make it better, to make it more resilient and future-proof. It's like saying that we have a, we have a black car and after one, that everybody can use. And then we realize that we can make this product better by introducing blue cars for boys and pink cars for girls. And maybe a gray car for colorblind people. That's evolutionary development. We have this car that we make it a little bit better. Or we may have a car that goes 100 miles per hour. And we introduce a new car that goes 200 miles per hour for sporty kids. So we basically we keep being the same product and making it a, fit, a better fit for a bigger audience. Uh, creative innovation is when we create a completely new set of products. We may start having a wheelbarrow to push all stuff around. And after a while, we, we start thinking, well, well, it's really hard work for me to, to push all this stuff around in this wheelbarrow. But why, why don't I try to catch one of those white horses over there and tame it and make it pull my carriage for me? So I try to do that, and after a while, I end up with a horse and carriage. It's a whole new product. It's still, it's still the same basic idea, maybe, moving stuff around, but it's a whole new product. And then after a while, I start realizing that this horse takes a lot of work. It needs to be groomed, it needs to be fed, it can be, can be sick. It's a lot of work. Can you do it better? Can you make a machine do the work for us? So we can have trucks. That's creative development. Uh, we have two problems to do with this. We never know what ideas will work. It's very easy, looking back, and seeing the development, connecting the dots. It's kind of obvious that when we have a track, trucks, you can understand why the wheelbarrow was a lousy idea, why it wasn't good enough. But having just a wheelbarrow, it's really, really difficult to imagine the truck and understanding that it will work. That's really the challenge of creativity. You can't connect the dots in a, if, in a box. You can only connect the dots backwards. Actually, I think it's Steve Jobs said that. So that's one problem. And really, we can't solve it. We have to live with that problem. We will never be able to connect the dots in advance. The only thing we can do is make sure that we get as many ideas as possible and we find a way of testing the ideas to see what works. As we do in Adobe. And the, uh, <coughs> the second problem is that we need input to get ideas. And our brain is actually working against us there. Because the brain is working with pattern, pattern recognition. And because there's so much information going around us all the time that we can't deal with it all at once. So the brain looks around and realizes that there are some patterns telling us what information is important and what's not important. Like uh, people smiling. They're probably not harmful, they're probably not uh, dangerous for me, so I don't need to pay that much, much attention to that. Someone shouting at me or hitting me probably doesn't like me, maybe I should do something. So that's a simple pattern. It makes me react faster, but it also hides information from me. Because if my brain sees a pattern that I'm used to, it's difficult to notice it. And then if you don't notice it, it's difficult to, to change it. So how can we get more ideas? Well, there are lots and lots of research on this. And the basic idea, or the basic process for getting ideas, for becoming creative, is really, really simple. <coughs> you pick a focus, you get some stimuli, and then you do the connection. Or well, the brain is doing the connection for us. An example would be if, uh, in a business context, we probably would not be focusing on flowers, we'd be focusing on on a program, or a product, or a customer, or a company, or a process, or something. Uh, but let's focus on the, on the flower. Uh, <clears throat> when we walk around, we probably see some patterns. We see some uh, flowers, they live, and after a while they die. And uh, that's normal. We don't really pay attention to all the flowers that are dying around us all the time, because we used to it. Uh, in Sweden, Comes fall, everything dies basically. 
being covered by the snow. Actually, for me, <laughs> coming here in Nuta Abu Dhabi, I was very, I actually paid a lot of attention to flowers in the beginning because they didn't die in, in autumn, as in Sweden. Here they had the blue blossoming all year round. It's very strange to me because it wasn't my, my normal pattern, and I started to recognize it. So if there is a normal pattern, uh, the brain hides it for us. So what happens if you change the pattern? Instead of saying that the flower lives and then dies, you're saying that the flower lives and never dies. Now what happens? It can't, it can't be. We know that the flower must live and die. But I'm telling you that there are flowers that actually never dies. You know that's impossible, right? If you live, you have to die. So I'm introducing a new pattern here, but your brain can connect the dots. And your brain doesn't like it. Your brain must find a pattern here. You must find a way to make this uh, reasonable. You must find it. That's how the, the brain works. It self-organizes. It finds patterns. It finds connections. So, you come up with the idea that let's have artificial flowers. They never die, right? That's basic uh, generation of creative ideas. That we, we have the basic pattern and then we change it. We're introducing a new uh, event. And when we can't connect the dots, that's a stimuli we need for the brain to fill, fill in the blanks by itself. So where do we find this uh, stimuli? Basically, if we do the textbook way, we can buy books with random words to generate this stimuli. We, we have a problem and we buy a book called Random Words, which may be 100 pages, tables after table with words. And words like corkscrew, pension, bank, credit card. And then we pick a random word and try to find a connection to our problem. That's a textbook or a way of getting creative ideas. Because we need the input to get the connection. Without input, no ideas. But if we don't have a textbook solution, we get uh, ideas from others. Input from the environment we live in. And usually what happens is that we have uh, a problem in one domain and then we apply a solution from another domain. We mix the domain. Basically, <laughs> or we have we apply a problem constraint from one domain to another. We're saying that we have a problem, uh, uh, customers can't pay for their products, they don't have any money. So we need to, that's a problem in some businesses. So how can, if you apply that to the banking industry, what does it mean for that? Maybe they come up with some ideas about credit cards as a result of some thinking, we don't, need, we don't have cash. So we need this uh, cross-domain discussions to, which is because what's, what's easy and obvious for in one domain, it's probably unknown in another. They say that we have a problem in, uh, in policing, that uh, the main problem for police officers are that they never know where the, where the uh, uh, criminals will be and where they will commit crimes. So what would happen if we invent a solution saying that, uh, well, what would happen if uh, we can predict the future, we can predict time, we can predict the uh, criminals. So we start thinking about it, and then the police officers with the problem, they meet some mathematicians, and all of a sudden we have minority report. Have you seen that movie? Mm -hmm. You know that it's true. We have something called predictive policing. So a bunch of mathematicians, they can actually predict where a crime will take place, at what time, in an area of 500 square meters. 
they're using it in, in Europe and in the US now, and basically reducing the rate of uh, criminality to 50 percent, just by being at a place where the criminal will be. That's a creative solution applied mathematics from the academic domain into real world policing in their process. And these are some other examples of creative solutions. Here we have the table tennis player meeting the interior designer. Probably difficult for the interior designer to come up with that idea is if he's never been playing table tennis. Here we have the, the chef needing a new lightning. Here we have the car mechanic taking a shower. And this would be the cleaning lady <laughs> having a baby. And this would be uh, either the sun cap use or the that's using the uh, the solution for bad weather, perhaps, modifying it a bit and using it in a completely new domain. I mean this is how creativity works. We have a problem in one domain, and we get an idea, why don't we try applying this problem to another domain, or we have a solution, we try to use it somewhere else. And we need that kind of uh, exchange of ideas. Like in a project, we mix business <coughs> people and engineers. If you have a bunch of engineers trying to solve a problem, they will never be creative. Especially not if we have engineers, they all coming from Sweden, or Germany, Switzerland, or UAE, and they are all 25 years old. <laughs> have you not heard me? <laughs> Okay, is this better? Wow. Now I can hear myself even. If you have a bunch of marketing guys, they will never be creative by themselves. They need somebody to, to feed them the stimuli. So, if you want to run a successful, a creative, innovative, high-tech project, we need to mix the domains. We need to, for IT people to discuss their problems with the business. And we need business people to discuss their problems with IT. That way we exchange information, we get stimuli from each other. And most likely, the IT people will come up with a solution that no business people will even imagine is possible. And very likely, some business guy will come up with a solution to some IT's problem that they couldn't really imagine was possible either. It's a two-way street. IT has problems, they have solutions, they talk to the business about them. Business have problems, they have solutions, they talk to IT about them. And we can become cre uh, creative because we are exchanging stimuli. So to do this exchanging, uh, we're actually communicating. And to communicate, we need meeting places. I mean, we can, we can call each other, speak on the phone, that's communicating, and that's good. That's better than not calling each other, but meeting each other is even better. Having, actually, having a video conference call is better than doing a phone call, but having a personal meeting is better. And having a personal meeting in front of a whiteboard is actually the, if you ask me, the optimal solution. Then we can exchange ideas. For but just having meeting places is not enough because communication requires trust. I'm standing here talking to you and it means I have to trust you. I will trust you that you will actually be interested in hearing me. You know these, uh, the statistics says that uh, uh, speaking about other people, that most uh, most people fear it more than dying <clears throat> because usually there's no trust. Uh, I have to trust you that you won't be uh, throwing tomatoes at me. 
<laughs> yeah, if, you, if you do, I will leave. I promise you that. Uh, but it, it requires uh, the trust between both parties to, to really communicate, to open up. And Kent Beck, the father of extreme programming, once said that uh, all methodology is based on fear. And you can actually, by looking, reading the description of methodology, the, the roles and the activities, the ceremonies, the docu documents, you can tell this is a fear of that methodology. Because everything we do in a project, we do really because we're afraid of what will happen if we don't do this. What's the consequence of not doing this? And then we will focus on doing the things we fear the most. So some of the common fears would be actually starting with the green fears. Uh, that's what most people start fearing in projects. We, we fear being the wrong product. We fear being late. We fear being having bugs. But actually, most methodologies focus on these fears. Uh, if you're looking at the ceremony, <coughs> we, we have a requirement sign-off. We gather a lot of people, and we have a requirement specification of 200 pages. We sit in one room, 10 people, and uh, probably all 10 people need to read the document in advance and send in some comments, so they spend 10 or 20 hours each preparing these requirements handoff is 200 hours. And then we have a meeting, a full day meeting, that's another 100 hours. We spend 300 hours on the requirement sign off because we fear we're getting the wrong product or we think that's our fear. But really, the requirement sign off is more about making sure that I'm not the one getting blamed for getting the wrong product. Because the 300 hours we just spent uh, didn't really involve talking to the customers, showing the prototype, doing anything to verify if they're actually building the right product. We didn't ask questions about it. We just spent 300 hours reading the document. So whenever you see a methodology description, read through it and ask yourself, this activity, this ceremony, this document, what fear is it attacking? And if you want creativity, these are the fears that will help you get them. So fear makes you shift focus away from creativity into just the same face. Now the mad, mad scientist, rise and fall, the mad scientist, he has no fears. He has no shame. That's why they can be so creative. Came up with crazy ideas. They don't need trust. They just do what they like to do. That's why we call them mad. Problem is, most of us are not mad scientists. We need the trust. And even fewer companies will actually hire the mad scientists. They like to hide the gray mass. So what the mad scientists would like to say is don't fear failures. Actually celebrate failing fast. Because failing means learning. And learning means, uh, you know that uh, Edison he invented the light bulb. He made a thousand experiments when he didn't manage to get the light to, to light. And communication and meeting places require trust. That's the foundation for creativity. It isn't your backlog, each car being an item you need to do. You want the time to think about new ways of doing things. New, uh, ways of improving. And if you're, uh, you have to do a lot of activities that are not of obvious value to yourself, or done in such a way that it take a lot of time, you're losing time you could be spending on doing creative, innovative projects.
product that. So we need to limit the amount of work being done. I actually have a company, a software development company in Sweden. And what will happen <coughs> if we uh, limit the work to be done? If you create time to be created. At my company, uh, last year we implemented a Google day. Basically one, one day every month we meet and we have one, we have breakfast together and we have one basic group. We don't work. You can do anything you want, you have to be at the office, and you can't work. Uh, that's too good, sorry. <laughs> and the story of my company is that we actually, it's a software development company. We have expert developers that we sell to customers where they can do help out in the customer's projects, basic consultancy. And then we have a product, a parking system. And this, uh, I mean, I think most developers, if they can choose between maintaining an existing product and developing new features in a cool new project at the customer side, most people would probably like to do the cool new project. And so did our consultants. So whenever we had something we needed to do in the parking system, it was kind of difficult to find volunteers to do it. And then we invented this Google Day. We got the people to the company. Do you know what the first thing we did was? Well, they had breakfast, but after breakfast. An architect just said, you know, shouldn't we try to uh, implement microservice architecture in a parking system? Yeah, that's a great idea. And all of a sudden, all 10 developers just threw themselves at this uh, parking system, which they really didn't enjoy before. But now they had a time to experiment, and the time creates commitment, and they started to... Uh, so we actually had to change the room from you're not allowed to work to you're not allowed to work on your original, on your uh, full-time projects. Also, uh, people need a safe haven to be created. That's why the, the mad scientist always has a cast somewhere far up in the mountains. Because <coughs> safe haven means you get time and quiet, quietness and independence to do what you need to do. So we want creativity, we need to create safe havens where the team can be independent. And we can do, if we have independence, we can have a team self-organize. Uh, usually, when some people try to decide what others do, they don't make the best decision. Especially not if we have a manager, you usually have old data making decisions on what's best. If you compare that with 10 people from the team having current data. Statistics show that probably the 10 people will come up with a better solution. Uh, in Lean, this is called the uh, book or something. Go where the work is. You, to make decisions, you have to see the work. Gemba. 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 Thank you. My Japanese is a bit rusty. <laughs> in the shop floor. Okay. Uh, and also, it is very difficult. I mean, management can probably get the people to walk through this way. But it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and we will lose a lot of energy. And this road may not be the best road. And the self organizing team is actually a long term solution because whenever you, as a leader, try to tell people exactly what to do and what, what they can do and what they can't do and when they should do it and how they should do it. People stop thinking, they stop using the brakes and they get lazy. If you let them self-organize, we just point us a direction. We want, we want you guys to change the world. You figure out how to do it. 
it's not me saying that you have to do the architecture, you will do the testing, and you will do the management. You have to figure out the best way to do it. And you have to do it by talking to each other. Then we get to use the full extent of your skills. And it will be, it will be probably difficult the first time. It will probably be difficult the second time and the third time. But hopefully, it will be a little bit less difficult every time. And in the end, you will have a very resilient team. Self-organization creates commitments, like it did at my company. If you help people uh, influence what they do, they like to do. And it makes your brain work. Another thing for creativity is like Michael was mentioning actually, uh, embrace uncertainty. In most organizations, we fear uncertainty. We don't start a project until we know exactly how much it will cost. This product will cost $1 million. We know that. Or actually, we don't. If we look at it, we probably know that this product will cost anything except a $1 million. It may be cost a $1 million, $2,000, a $1 million, $2,000, maybe $2 million. It may be cost half a million, or maybe $900. $98,000. The chances are it won't cost $1 million. But still, we spend a lot of time trying to get an exact number because we fear uncertainty. But actually, uncertainty is what creates opportunities, a variability. If we do things in different ways, we will never know exactly what we'll end up with. But chances are it will be created and in the end, if we try it long enough, we get a very innovative solution. So, we need, uh, since we're using uh, uncertainty, we need to make sure that we're on the right track. We need to experiment and learn, because we're not sure if we're really the right product. We're not sure if we will succeed in this. So we need to test it and show it and get feedback and then adjust our ways of working, make it better. And in the end, we will be successful. If we say that these are the features we need, we start a 10-year project, day one, we say these are the features we need to develop, and we start developing, and we don't allow ourselves the uncertainty of building something else then, yeah, we might, probably, we might end up with the things in the features try to build, but we will have no creativity in that project because everything is predetermined. Uh, Isaac Newton, Newton said, uh, if I see further, it's because I can stand on the shoulders of giants. And that's what we try to do. We make experiments, so we can climb up one step and the other, and then we make new experiments. The experiments on the shoulders of the job. So, uh, innovation requires not only stimuli, communication, and meeting places, it requires the absence of fear, time to innovate, a safe haven to do it like, to do, to do it at, the need to embrace uncertainty. We need to do experiments. So, you mean stimuli, like from working with cross-functional, cross-domain team, involving business and technology together in one room. Uh, communication meeting places, like doing daily stand-ups, talking to each other every single day, having retrospectives in regular intervals, thinking, is this the best way of doing it? Can we change something? Trust like an openness, talk, uh, give feedback to each other. I think this was a really bad speech. Uh, or say that, oh, it's a great speech. I believe in the floor that much. Uh, and transparency, saying that this is a plan we have. We put it on the wall. So this is a plan we have. Let's hear your feedback about it. Should we change something? Uh, time and safe, uh, time, using time boxes, 
self-organization using limited VIPs, VIPs being work in process limits, basically saying that this T, it's a technique from Kanban, lean management, basically saying that this team can only work on two features at one time, or three or four or five, whatever limit you put, but it's a way of actually creating time to innovate. Oops, sorry. And embracing uncertainty. Yeah. Like continuously adapting the process, how we work, we don't really know the, the effect of the change. And we change it back if it doesn't work. So we continuously improve. And we may change the scope. We say we start out with this list of features in our build, and then uh, uh, after a month, after a week, after two months, we may change it if we find something better. And experimenting and learning, like doing iterations, getting code out there, showing, showing it off to people and getting feedback on it. Learning from experiments. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. The most difficult thing is the decision to act. You may not hear what Earhart said. The rest is merely tenacity. So let's teach the math scientist and be agile. Fear no shame, fear no failure. Thank you. says that if I have a lot of money and I have a lot of uh, resources, an infinitely huge lab, I can be Batman. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I tend to see the sarcasm in that statement and I tend to cannot correlate that with, with one of the statements we mentioned as an innovation ingredient is um, I need a safe heaven where, you know, where it's peaceful, where it's quiet, there's a lot of independence. Um, practically speaking, I've seen the opposites happening, I mean, especially when you talk about creative innovations. Uh, you can see things like iPhone was innovated when they were totally down and under, Apple for example. Uh, a lot of other companies and a lot of other people, um, people like um, Thomas Edison were totally out of the game when they were innovating something out of the ordinary. Uh, companies that hire a lot of big budgets and a lot of big technologies and resources and have people even hired who do these sort of innovations in, in quiet labs tend to, you know, uh, perform lesser than people from smaller companies or with lesser budgets, with no time frames, and a lot of, you know, uncertainties. So how do you, uh, you know, justify that statement you make? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, I've, I've been, I've been, okay. yeah, no, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I can talk, just talk. Uh, basically, startups add a constraint, and there, there is no money that forces creativity by itself. And uh, I'm not saying that you can't be creative if you're not agile. I think I'm saying agile helps you be creative. And uh, actually, I have one more thing to say. Yeah, uh, creativity requires focus. And uh, I think that's uh, the, the major reason for ruining a lot of projects, high-tech projects, that you lose focus. You have people, start, people in the project, they're not just in one project, they are in two, three, or four different projects at the same time, doing part-time work, uh, continuously task switching between the projects or being pulled out from one team to leave to another team. That creates disturbances that lower the creativity. But if you look at the, the mad scientists of the world, they are focused. They, they have the ideas and they focus on that idea. And then they can have a new idea and focus on that idea. I mean, the idea of the mad scientist is actually that our brain works with uh, the uh, pattern recognition and it filters out uh, irrelevant information. And what the scientists show is that uh, mad people <clears throat> and creative people, they, they share a common trait. They are very bad at filtering out information. 
So they, that's why you eventually go mad because you, you, there's too much information. You, oh, there's a flower dying. Oh, there's a light lightning. And wow, that's a camera. And wow, that's a white chair. You go around like that and eventually it's just information overload for your brain. That's one way of being mad. But it's also uh, the sign of a creative person that they are very bad compared to a healthy, a normal person at filtering out information. Because, wow, if it's a white chair, I wonder what will happen if I make it real. And if I make it gigantic, like this entire house. I mean, if you pay attention to all the details, that's a creative star set. I think with mad scientists, the focus is so much that he's obsessed, really, isn't it? Yeah. It becomes an obsession, the focus. That's how focused he is. Yeah. That's right, Matt. Uh, Pierre? Yeah, I just have a comment. You should have a creativity. You need to have a constraint. You have pieces. You need to have constraint. You need to have a constraint of uh, resource, or you need to have a constraint of option. Uh, if you have, I don't agree with the big bang theory guy because if you have everything, he's not going to do anything. Because when you have everything, uh, your creativity is good. Uh, if you think of a lot of, I was just thinking about the cinema. Industry in the 50s, when they, in the USA they, they had Macartism, where there are a lot of sensors, and the guys start to think about how the way they can turn around the situation. So it pushed the creativity. Constraint it can be, it's a, it's, I think it's a big asset for creativity. Yeah, adding constraints to, uh, to a successful solution or to a uh, Time problem, is uh, adding creativity. Another remark on another chair is, um, sorry for that. So, uh, two point, different points. So, what you say is, yeah, true, but perhaps not to understand. Uh, we are using a pattern in Agile that's called Feel as Change, is to set an in transition. Meanwhile, is that having transparency means nobody has fear to show how good or how bad they are. But this is quite a little bit different about communication. Sometimes it's in tradition management, like if you mention a photo and have a system in development. But if you look at the people, you have frustration. Then you have what you take Google is, but you rephrase as FedEx days, with when you have uh, this frustration in your teams, but you don't just have work, but just staying just busy. And you want to have this inside out from, uh, from your guys, this innovation to have this. Do you understand the opportunity? Then you have this momentum, one day in a month, one day every two or three months, to say, OK, guys, come here. Use this place and do whatever you want. And this is just get, getting outside of all the frustration that I collected during one day because I need to follow the processes. And then Google creates Gmail, 80% of their revenue of this LS. So sometimes then you can't make Let's say a big bank look completely crazy. Then it increase the level of fear. But sometimes you say, okay guys, you can make this, but let's take one day, one time, just to solve whatever you want. And you moving around the seat and you have this, let's say, emerging innovation. But it's also so you were right a little bit to rephrase. Because as a boring other that. So Thank you. Thank you.